I, I will not talk much about the successes of science in, in the past, let's say, 100 years or 150 years. Uh, I'm more concerned about how we communicate science. Um, because I have the feeling that there is an increasing gap between what scientists do and what those people who eventually have the power, and these are the voters, know about science. So it's related to this subject and <clears throat> when I was asked to give a title, actually I didn't know what to talk about. Uh, and after I gave the title, um, my ideas somehow were directed into a different uh, direction, but to a certain extent I'm talking about, I, I'm, let's say, what I'm going to talk about is related to this title. Now I think we all agree that we have a kind of world of crises. Um, <clears throat> we are facing more or less on an everyday level the danger of having a financial crisis. Um, we have a political crisis between different countries, America, Europe, England, and uh, I don't mention the others. Um, <clears throat> we do have a crisis with um, the resources of our world and with possibly climate change. And in particular, as Ferenc already mentioned, we seem to have a crisis with democracies. And um, <clears throat> so somehow at least those leaders um, which came to power recently, uh, I would not consider any more of that liberal kind of democracy, uh, <clears throat> which at least uh, I grew up with and I would be happy to live in also in the future. Now let me say a few words about uh, the first crisis in order to give you a good example of maybe bad scientific thinking. I'm a physicist, so physicists are always accused or are always accused to oversimplify things. So let me oversimplify this first aspect. Um, <clears throat> we all know Newton's first law in physics. Um, an object either remains at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon by external forces. It's a very simple law. We use it successfully in physics or have used it successfully. The question is, does there a similar law exist also for other sciences. So this is a law about what happens if we don't intervene, if there is no force acting on things. So what happens in other disciplines? So question, is there a kind of first law, Newton's first law in economy? And I would say yeah, there seems to be in the sense that uh, our economy is based on a law which I formulated, um, coming from the physics side in maybe a very primitive way, an open economy either continues to grow with a constant growth rate or with a constantly increasing growth rate unless acted upon by forces. So our economy, I have the feeling, is based on exponential growth. Now, what happens if the resources are limited? And Biology knows, to tell the story, what happens to exponential growth when resources are limited. But I have the feeling that mankind had an ingenious idea to deal with that problem. And the ingenious idea was to invent virtual resources. Uh, <clears throat> and I think the person who started it um, maybe not really, it started maybe already 100 years ago or even earlier, but the person who started is, with respect to the present situation might have been Nixon in 1971 when he uh, <coughs> more or less lifted the balance between paper money and gold reserves. But in the meantime, I think we have been doing much, much better. Um, Banks and insurances gave us virtual money. So um, 
That, of course, makes resources unlimited. Well, limited maybe by the memory power of computers. But that's really huge. And I learned, I think it was from Sean, some years ago, that before the 2007 crisis, the ratio from actual values to virtual values was 1 to 20. And I don't know how it is today, but I'm afraid it's even worse. Pardon? Okay, good. But 1 to 20 means, well, I counted the chairs here in the room, it's roughly 100 chairs, that five people will get a seat when suddenly the crisis starts. So that's roughly the situation. And since about 10 years, we even have virtual currencies, which can make this even worse. So I think this idea of inventing virtual resources was kind of ingenious when you look at this first law of economics that we should maintain exponential growth. It's very easy to do it that way. Now, of course, one may wonder if we had this ingenious solution, uh, why did evolution not come up with that solution? <laughs> and um, the only answer I got is we cannot live on virtual food, essentially, or made with virtual partners. Maybe in the future we can, I don't know. But um, <clears throat> that reminded me of a saying of Douglas Adams, human beings who are almost unique and having the ability to learn from experience of others are also remarkable for their apparent disinclination to do so. And I think this is what happens after 2007, and I think it happens again and again and again. Okay, so this is, as I said, the simplified physics thinking, and this is a picture which I like very much. I stole it actually from Juan Enriquez. Uh, it's somehow the, how I view the situation of the world today. You may know the picture, I suppose. Um, <coughs> So that's how we are dealing with these crises. Okay, so let me come to the point actually I wanted to talk about. Uh, and there is still, in a certain way, an ivory tower of science. And no, no, we just write about the world. You guys have to go out and save the bloody thing. I think is still also true to a certain extent with science. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about now are two different things. One is about the communication of scientific insights and not the communication to our peers, but how can we communicate our scientific results to political, economical decision makers, to the media, and to the voters. And I think we have to address all three groups because if we address only one, I think it will have almost no effect. And this is a problem because here is where scientific knowledge can be and has been misused a lot. The second issue I'm going to talk about is slightly more positive. I think what we need, and that came also to a certain extent, I think, what um, Professor Crow mentioned in his talk, we need a kind of interacting network of global science. And by global, I don't mean all over the world. By global, I mean all over disciplines. So that the different disciplines start to cooperate more. And that was also mentioned by Ferenc, to communicate in between disciplines. And this is, I think, where scientific knowledge can be most useful. Okay, so let me start with the first one. And I would like to start with um, what is called a paradox, Simpson's paradox. Uh, <clears throat> I'm afraid, as many of you are sciences, you know this. I learned about this only two years ago. In physics, we do not learn about the Simpson's paradox. It's strange. And I think in school, it's definitely never taught. So I made, gave you, will give you a very crude example. I don't want to be political incorrect, but um, 
I will talk about white and black people and uh, criminals and non-criminals, but you will see hopefully at the end that it's not meant to be uh, in any way, um, <coughs> yes, as I said, politically incorrect. So let's suppose, I have made up the numbers, but you can come up with your own numbers. Let's suppose there is a city with 500,000 inhabitants, 250,000 are white, 250,000 are black, and you have some criterion which I don't want to talk about, that's a difficulty in itself, but let's suppose you agreed on a criterion under which condition a person is counted as a criminal and under which condition not. So these are the numbers. So this diagram would tell you that obviously uh, black people or colored people are more criminal than the others. But now I do something which is very easy to do with almost any set of data. I split it into two subsets. And the subset is here, poor people and rich people. And of course, among the poor people, the whites are in the minority, the blacks are in the majority in this city. And with respect to rich, it's the other way around. Now within each group, I can again count the numbers here and there, and if you add them up, it's the same table as here. It's not fake data, it's the same data. But now you see that in each group, both of them, it's the whites which have a larger percentage of criminality than the blacks. Same data, same set, nothing fake about that. Just by splitting the data in a different way, I can give right the opposite message. And this tells us that we can cheat with these diagrams in any way we like. And most people, I think, are not aware of these things. And um, <clears throat> they might accept that maybe in one group it is like that, but that in both groups, which add up to the total table, you have the reverse situation. It's something, well, that's why it's called a paradox. Mathematically, it's not. It's very simple to explain. But <clears throat> I think this shows very drastically how you can present data in any way you like. Okay, the second thing I'd like to talk about is a sentence which you might have often heard. Science has proven that. Or science can prove, or whatever. Now, <clears throat> when I prepared the talk, I came about uh, to two pages which look very, very much alike, and in particular, I think, from the distance, you wouldn't see any difference between these two. One is Wikipedia, and the other is a different page, but they are very, very much alike and give the same impression. So Wikipedia, about the age of Earth, well, it's the standard things. It's, of course, a longer page. I just have the first lines and it gives the current status on signs about the age of Earth. Now the other page was so-called, um, <coughs> I even have to look at count, uh, uh, one cannot even read it really good, Contrapedia, the truth words encyclopedia, and it gives the statement more or less the same that the Earth is 6,000 years old. And it gives proof, science can show, it is this science has proved that type of um, page, very much like Wikipedia, that one can prove that the Earth is 6,000 years old. So, what's wrong? Whom to believe? I mean, we would all believe, of course, the other Wikipedia, but then I came about this book, and this is just an example, I don't want to to, to talk against this book in particular, but this is one of hundreds of examples. Um, <clears throat> and you should see this number here, 500,000 in print. Um, I think you have to be uh, uh, Stephen Hawking in order to get this number of books sold. sold. So these books sell very, very well. And of course, the author has a degree in chemistry. 
He has written articles and published articles in Nature. He has been a chess master of New Zealand. So in any way, I would say very, very respectable. And <coughs> how does he argue for a young Earth? Science has proven that. And then there are many, many things which I do not want to go through. Magnetic field of the Earth, helium concentration in the atmosphere, old supernova remnants, the receding moon from the Earth due to tidal forces, salt concentration in oceans, even recent discoveries in science, rotation velocities in galaxies. It's much easier to in the rotational velocities in galaxies by assuming a young Earth and dark matter and accelerate the expansion of the universe. In all cases, when you try to figure out how do they get this idea that from these things a young Earth follows, you will find that the explanations are very, very scientific. It's very difficult to see where is it where you can put your finger to say, well, here it might be wrong. In most cases, you will find that these people use the same num equations, same numbers as the si scientists use, which argue in favor of an old Earth. But then there comes one point where they usually make a simple assumption about something where we might have problems to have a good theory. In some cases, for instance, in the receding moon from the Earth, where we even have to admit we don't know. And that's how these people communicate science, and obviously they are very, very successful. And the question I raise, why are we not? So, I don't know whether this is the right word. Actually, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, it is a good word. Okay, thank you. Because I looked it up in a dictionary. Because uh, we have in Germany the word Quacksalber, which some people might know. And I was looking for that word in English, and I didn't know. <coughs> so, why are these people so successful? Well, first of all, many people hate science. And they hate science for many reasons. Scientists receive a lot of money for something nobody understands. And in addition, that's their view, science produced only bad things, like atomic bombs, etc., etc. So, why are we not able to communicate that this is not the right way to look at science? Now, there are many scientists with all possible degrees. And that's one of the things where it's, I would say, where you can even recognize the quality of a scientific article because when you take a scientific article people are quoted by names. In these articles, which I mentioned before, people are always quoted with their degrees. Dr. Humphrey so-and-so has proven that. Professor so-and-so has proven that. Well, in scientific articles it says, well, this and that person, without mentioning the title. Usually, at least in physics, uh, <coughs> we don't use these titles. Okay, but there are many scientists who do this type of voodoo science. And for me, the essential question is, obviously good scientists are good in communicating their, communicating their results to other good scientists. For instance, in peer-reviewed journals, in conferences, private communications, etc. But somehow, and I don't want to make it a general rule, it's just, let's say, a kind of tendency. I mean, these are, let's say, averages. It's not that I want to say every good science is bad in, scientist is bad in communicating, and I don't want to say that every bad scientist is good in communicating. But obviously, some groups of scientists are quite bad, much better communicating science to politicians, the media, and the public than we are. So I think one of the things we have to learn, in particular, I must say, from my field, from physics, because in particular in physics, it's very difficult to communicate results to a public. Maybe much more difficult than many other sciences. And I don't know whether mathematics is the reason or whatever. But I think we have to overcome that. 
Now let me come to the second part of things I wanted to say, and I like this metaphor. The metaphor of Aikido. Now, Aikido is Japanese. Um, <coughs> it was invented in Japan about slightly more than 100 years, so it's a quite young martial arts. But it's interesting to go through these three Chinese characters, uh, which the Japanese, of course, got from the Chinese. So the first character, I, means to come together, to meet, but it also means to harmonize to synchronize even in some situations. The second one, the key, was originally simply a kind of gas, a gaseous substance. But it became also a character for spiritual strength, spiritual power, spiritual energy. And the last one, well, that's the famous Do, or in Chinese Dao. Uh, the way how to do things. The direct meaning is path, but in this sense it means the way how to do, the way how to bring together to harmonize the spiritual forces. That's the idea between Aikido. And <coughs> for me it is a metaphor to utilize in principle the thrust of an opponent, not to work against it. And I think what we did in, well, in principle throughout history, was always trying to oppose things and not to use the power of other things to that purpose. Now, how can that be done? And in particular, you may ask, can it be done by a single person? Um, I wonder how many people know this person. Anybody knows her? Her name is Ursula Bona. Presumably, you know her? Okay, okay. <laughs> so she died last year. And uh, she became famous as what had been called the banana women. So in around 1970s, she saw a movie about production methods in Nicaragua. And then she asked the questions, why are bananas so cheap in Switzerland? despite the fact that people in the countries of production are living so miserably. So then she started to get some friends, four or five other women, and they started to make this public, to make public the conditions in that case in Nicaragua and other producing countries, and to make public how companies like Migro, Migros and uh, Chiquita, the banana, at least how they make money without giving it to these people in Nicaragua. So she had 20 years. In 1992, in Switzerland, the Max Havelock Foundation was founded, and then she stopped this company, this, this, uh, <coughs> um, well, these, these uh, activities, because she said we shouldn't work against each other if we have the same goals. But for 20 years, she was fighting for it, and she had success. And I always wondered why it were only four women and not one man in the group. And the only reason I can think of, she wanted to have things done and not talk about it and have workshops and discussions and how can we maybe do it better. She just started. She was never satisfied with the results. Also, not after Max Havela came into being, this, this uh, foundation, but at least she did something. And that she was a single woman, the wife of a clergyman, uh, <coughs> just happy to get the rights of voting in 1972. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so one can do something. And now I show you a different person. Uh, this is Hilary Brown. I met her in Kursik two months ago, and she gave a talk at the craft conference. And she was working on circular economy. It was not her idea, circular economy, it's a, it's a more general idea. But she applied it, or wanted to apply it, to especially the reason of Kursik. So what you see here is Kursik forests, um, <coughs> Kursik's 
build environments, Kurosek's tourism industry, Kurosek community. So this is really adapted to the needs of Kurosek. And she wanted to give an example that, at least in a small community, you can start to do things and to do some things which are, in the sense, what we said, called sustainable. So the idea of circular economy essentially is the waste of one company is the input of a second. And uh, <coughs> it's not the only idea in that direction. Maybe some of you have heard about blue economy or ZERI. ZERI stands for Zero Emission Research Initiative. They have roughly about 200 projects all around the world. And if you look at um, Europe, I found it quite remarkable that there is a relatively empty space here with only Serbia uh, having two projects. Not even all, uh, Austria, not Hungary, not Poland, and so on. Uh, only a few in Germany. I was quite disappointed that there are not more projects in Germany. Uh, <coughs> but you see, can see these maps. There are another there are other initiatives. Cradle to cradle design has the same idea, no waste products. We should be more careful about uh, <coughs> being able to recycle or to use things which up to now have counted as waste. So, what I could imagine, and I even thought for a while Kursek might be an ideal place to do it, was a kind of master in circular economy. <laughs> So, you make a bachelor in physics, in biology, in chemistry, economy, engineering, whatever. You have to be good at least in one subject of these. And then the master program specializes on methods, how to make the waste of one project the input for others. And I think there are many ways to do that if you just think about it. And these people can become advisors for entrepreneurs, for cities, for companies. They should work in groups because, as I said, you need, in principle, all of these sciences in order to do that. And I could even imagine that commercial text may one day depend on this degree of circularity. Okay, so this is, for me, somewhat a kind of future, an idea. And I leave you with two more quotations from Douglas Adams in particular the right one, a common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. And that's what Sean and I actually talked about before the conference started. Okay, so thank you very much and thank you for your attention.